Hello, and uh, welcome to the Studio Utani commentary track for Alien. I'm Matt Jarjosa. This is part three of a retrospective look at the Alien franchise, and today we are watching the theatrical cut of the film. Um, this is YouTube, no video, no audio, but you can sync this commentary up with your own copy of the film by pressing play now. Fox Lucas. Hello, I'm uh, Matt Jarjosa. I'm Justin Macy. And uh, we are going to be watching Alien today. Uh, one of the greatest uh, science fiction films of all time. One of the greatest films of all time. What can a couple of uh, guys from Michigan possibly add to the ongoing conversation surrounding this movie? Well, stay tuned and find out. Uh, so, uh, a little bit of a fun fact here. Uh, not only is this the first film in the Alien franchise, it is the uh, first film in the Alien franchise directed by Ridley Scott. Yeah. And he would come back later to do Prometheus and uh, Alien Covenant. Yeah. Yeah. Little little fun fact. I didn't think too many people were aware of that, but now you know. Um, I, I like this... Uh, I, I've always loved this uh, this uh, logo here, the kind of fade in, and uh, it's interesting how they came up with the title Alien because originally it was Dan O'Bannon had like Star Beast and whatnot, and it was this, um, all sort sorts of different names, and then he realized how often the the word Alien appeared in the script, and it's like, well, that's genius because it, it's so simple, and yet it's also such a very strange word. Um, and the starkness with which it's being shown here is, uh, uh you know, it, there's something kind of familiar and otherworldly about it. And I'd like to mention, uh, the, uh, planet background for the opening titles could also double as an alien egg or perhaps the alien's head. Oh yeah, it could. You know? I, I mean, it's, it's clearly a planet, but right, you can right. see how it visually connects to those two big things later in the movie yeah you know for you know for sure it's it's all kind of tying together just the otherworldliness um so i always thought that the, the nostromo for uh, until fairly recently i thought it was the giant refinery that's being pulled but it's actually the little tiny ship in the foreground oh. and uh, the entirety of the movie takes place on this ship here um okay I didn't, I didn't know that, yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize that until I read, uh, I got the Alien, the Blueprints book, and then I read, oh, I'm an idiot. The Nostromo's the, the, the ship that's pulling the refinery. That makes more sense. Um, and that's a great shot there, too. You can see Alien learned a lot of stuff uh, from Star Wars, clearly. Mm -hmm. And the interiors of the ship here map out the area where the action's going to take place for the rest of the movie. Which, yeah, it's establishing. Yeah. Um, and this uh, this hallway here, that actually at the end, that they put a mirror at the end of the hallway to extend it. Oh. The, this movie's full of all sorts of really great, you know, I, I call them cheap tricks, but that's not uh, demeaning in any way. Yeah, we can bring some of those up later, because I, yeah. I got a lot to say about some of yeah. those. Yeah. The special effects in this movie are brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Especially, you know, for their use of practical effects to create this whole other world is fantastic. Yeah, as a um, filmmaker myself, you know, I, I take a lot of inspiration from this, even when I'm not making science fiction necessarily. Um, you know, the deep focus in the photography yeah. uh, sort of gives more atmospheric quality to the whole thing. You know, we aren't just seeing what's happening in the foreground we're seeing the entire world being pho uh, photographed absolutely so uh this is an interesting uh part of the film here uh and i've always liked this there's something kind of eerie about this um you know obviously the crew is in stasis right now and the computer is running the ship and now the computer is sort of um, intercepting what we learn later is the distress signal. And there's something just a little bit of an eerie commentary about like the role that artificial intelligence plays in our lives. And 
the, how we depend on it and how, you know, it could easily, you know, in a situation like that where it's guiding the transportation of the vehicle, it could lead us someplace which we don't necessarily want to go. Um, and I, I, I've always thought that was really spooky. If you notice a lot of the color white in this movie, in various shades of it, varying a great deal. You know, depending how it's lit, depending what time of day it is, all sorts of things. You can tell that a lot went into that. Well, uh, one of the things I really like about the movie is, uh, is so, so here here's a hot take from me. Alien uh, has one of the most realistic depictions of the future of any science fiction film because, you know, you look at something like... Uh, 2001 and it's such a clean future and then uh with uh with this it's like you know we haven't given up our dependence on oil you know we run out of oil on earth we'll just go out into space and get it uh and we just kind of double down on everything and it's a dirty used uh universe with uh everything's designed with utility in mind and um i i i find that uh, I try to be an optimistic person, but I find that uh, I find that depiction of the future uh, very bleak, uh, but ultimately pretty real. So we're meeting the. Uh, so you were saying earlier we uh, we get in the establishing uh, the setting, and now we're being introduced to rock, our ensemble here. And there's also kind of a little bit of a a birth uh, and rebirth kind of. Uh, Thing yeah, going. imagery with the uh cryopods yeah yeah it's well it's it, you, john hurt here uh standing up it's it's kind of um i don't know it, it, there, there's something about it that's kind of like you're rising from the dead or something so we're six minutes into the movie and really uh, yeah yeah wow yeah and we're uh, just now kind of getting introduced to these characters and you know, that's kind of one of the things about the pacing of this movie. It's very slow, uh, and that's very deliberate. Um, mm-hmm. it, it's kind of unsuspectingly painting the audience into a corner. Yes, you think, yeah, it feels like nothing's going to happen, and then when, so then when <laughs> things do happen, yeah, it, it's it, shocking. Oh, yeah, it's it's brilliantly done, even though you know what kind of movie it is. It, it, it you know, it pulls the wool over your eyes a little bit. And I love, uh, just a so a few bits of dialogue here and just to kind of get us give us a clue about who these characters are it doesn't you know it does it doesn't take much we just need a little bit of it establishes harry dean stanton as the comic relief yeah uh tom scarrett as the hero yeah well yeah he's the hero uh, at least it seems like he's going to be yeah yeah yeah. uh and then it of course ends up being ripley yeah um that's uh, we'll talk a little bit about the comic relief with uh Harry Dean Stanton and uh he's he's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. And uh Yafe Akpoto. Uh him and Harry Dean Stanton make an excellent uh comedic team in this movie. I have a signed poster by uh Yafe Akpoto. Uh I don't know where I put it though. <laughs> I it's somewhere in, in in here. Interesting thing is actually Harry Dean Stanton did not uh, he, he basically, when he, when he was, uh, asked to audition for this movie, he basically told Ridley Scott, I, I hate science fiction and I hate spaceships. I hate all that stuff. And Ridley's like, cool. I can work with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a quote from Harry Dean Stanton. He was arguing with the director one time and he said, just let me do what I want. <laughs> you know, all these great directors, they directed me. They just let me do what I want. I love Harry Dean Stanton. Oh, uh, yeah. he, he was a good man. Good actor. Great actor. So one of the great things about science fiction is that none of these numbers actually have to make any sense as long as the characters understand them and the story is communicated to the audience. So uh, Dallas is getting the story from Mother here. and He's learning something and simultaneously our the rest of the ensemble is learning something which is... And, and it's good editing too because it's like some we know okay something's up and then these characters are learning wait something's up and we're not anywhere near earth and it's 
slowly building the mystery of um you know of what of what's going on and it's, uh, you know kind of pulls you in um lambert um for some reason there's a lot of people that don't like uh veronica Car uh, cartwright in this movie and um I find that really str I, I don't know why. Yeah, she plays a fully realized character. That's one of the great things about this movie is because it has a pretty small cast, mm -hmm. they really get to establish each character in great depth, oh, I think. Oh, definitely, definitely. I, I, I'm just saying that, like, for some reason in the actual fan base, people think her character is really annoying, and I just don't... I, I Because she she's, like, later on in the film, we'll see, she's, like crying her eyes out and that annoys people and i'm like I, it's realistic yeah yeah, yeah. it's also she's everybody the, just died yeah yeah she's yeah i don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't get that um so we get some uh the little um i didn't real we went to go see alien at the the main art you know, remember, yeah. remember those days oh, <laughs> when yeah. go to a theater? It was the first time I, I realized there's actually a lot of really funny dialogue in this movie. Yes. Because the audience is laughing. I mean, it's, it took that me, mm -hmm. it took that for me to realize, um, there's, it's almost a bit of a lost art. It's kind of become a trope to have like comedy in a, in a horror movie, but this movie does it very well and very effectively as just to kind of break up the tension a little bit. And I, I genuinely did not realize that until I was watching it with an audience. And it sort of builds the tension too, having just a, you know, you're enjoying the first half hour of this movie and you know, yeah, but, but it's, it's like, it's not unrelenting. It has those little moments just to break up the tension a little bit. And it's so, pitch perfect and it's like i said it's it, doing that's almost like a lost art nowadays mm -hmm. yeah let's go for the bonus situation yeah 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 each character has their own thing obviously yeah. yafiad and uh um, Harry Dean Stanton are they are, want their money they want their money <laughs> yeah yeah so and and Ash is telling them here that's like Ash it, is a son of a bitch yeah, yeah uh yeah yeah it's and it's you were you were saying earlier about Ian Holmes performance it's, it's perfect yeah it's really fantastic I think he's he might give the best performance in the movie just because it's a little hammy it's a little well, and it's also, it's, it's double faced. Yeah. It could, you know, you could see it as like, he's just following company orders and you could also see it as he's following company orders. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. It adds to the rewatchability of the movie. Yeah. Is he, Ian Holmes. Uh, the, they're approaching the title screen of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> How do they not know it's, uh, there, there's going to be aliens. Um, yeah, so it's, um, an, that's a, I always, that's a gorgeous shot. Mm -hmm. and it's so minimal. Yeah. You know, it's probably just pa a painted backdrop. Yeah. With yeah. a model flying, you yeah. know, a model moving yeah, closer to it. It's a sense of scale. Yeah. 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 And, uh, another thing I know, I noted this in the Prometheus commentary. I, I felt like they did a good job of taking these very analog uh, computer screens and sort of making them look a little bit more modern, but it's still tech uh, technically like consistent, like stylistically consistent. Mm -hmm. Do you know how they made the computer screens in here? <sighs> it's probably, it looks like a light and some uh, gels on top of it. Possibly. I mean, obviously they didn't yeah. have visual effects like computer back yeah. then so it, it's either some kind of animation or it's in some kind of in-camera effect mm -hmm. or, or it, maybe it's very early like computer graphics i don't think so because uh i would just guess not because escape from new york 
a few yeah. years later just used a light and different shapes. Yeah, I, I uh, actually you know? genuinely don't know how. I'd have to look that up. Um, but, you know, it works. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah. You know, this, it, it's still, even that shot that we just saw of the Nostromo, you know, kind of descending towards the planet. That's, you know, that still holds up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All the smoke yeah, the, around here. Yeah. And this, this is gorgeous. It's, it's very atmospheric. Yeah. The film did win uh, the Oscar for visual effects. Oh, really? Yeah. Was it nominated for production design? Yes, it was. Okay. That's good. Um, so this was another idea that Dan O'Bannon had. He he was kind of tired of science fiction movies where the ship would just sort of come to the planet and land. And he thought it would be a much more complex and difficult process. So he wrote um, this, uh, this much more in-depth landing scene that kind of shows... A little bit how stressful it actually is and mm -hmm. and all that uh shaky camera yeah you know for the for the um for the ship shaking yeah uh, yeah and you know ridley and the dp kind of interpreting uh interpreting how uh how stressful a situation it actually is i'm pretty sure those are christmas lights <laughs> i i could be wrong but it looks sure. like it yeah i i mean but it's like I don't know. You, you just sort of buy it. Yeah. Every, there's there were two shots in the movie when I was watching it that I didn't buy. Yeah, I know. Yeah, literally I, two shots I, I, in a I, two hour long I, I special think, effects I, movie. I I think I know exactly what two shots you're talking about. Yep, I think you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I I don't mind moments like that because I'm I I think. Uh, I, I think there's some something kind of charming about being reminded that you're watching a movie. Yes. Like, uh, the one one of the special effects moments uh, oh. reminded me of in Psycho at the end when you see that it's him and his uh, mother costume yeah. and the whole audience kind of laughs for a second because I, and the skeleton and all that. Yeah. yeah. I, I, and I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about yeah. that when we get there. So they just land out on the planet, and um, yeah, the everything's falling apart because it's yeah, it's obviously very stressful to the machinery. And we can't hear it now, but the sound mixing in this scene is yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, it's no, impeccable. It, yeah, and uh, Jerry Goldsmith's score also adds a lot to it. Um, there was a moment earlier where we hear some metal creaking. Um, for some reason, when I was little and I was watching this movie, I for some reason I thought, wait a minute, was that the alien? <laughs> and also, uh, parts of Jerry Goldsmith's score, actually, the horn, I actually, the the horns that are like, for some reason, I also thought that was the alien. I was well, a I was a dumb kid. What can I say? I noticed uh, when this when the score does come in, which is pretty rarely, at least from what I was, could catch on to when that last time I watched it. When it does come in, it really hits you hard. Well, yeah, and I think uh, uh, Jerry Goldsmith's score for this film is is celebrated. It's it's uh, people love it. He was not happy with ultimately how they used it. They because they they kind of chopped it up and they interspersed it where they wanted to. And he's like, well, that's not what I wrote. And I think and we'll point it out. There's actually a part that they actually took a score from a different movie that yeah, he from did Freud. Yeah. The Freud one. Yeah. Uh, and they, and that's a TV screen. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Pretty, pretty great. Holy cow. Um, but they, um, what was I saying about? Yeah. Jerry Goldsmith was not happy with the way his score was handled, but, um, he did get a, I believe a golden globe nomination for it. Oh, well. Wow. So, and there was a, in the director's cut of the film, there's actually a, a more extended version of this scene where Lambert is deciphering the code and they actually kind of confirm it's more of a, an unknown distress signal. Um, it's an interesting little alternative version of, of the scene. Um, yeah, there's a, 
you know, those, the kind of the big difference between the theatrical cut and the director's cut is the pacing. Like this movie is very, very slow, which is for a lot of people that can, especially for modern day audiences, that can be a little bit difficult to, to deal with. Uh, but, um, the director's cut is much faster pacing. I think the movie's kind of suspiciously slow, and I think that adds to oh, I agree. the uh, tension of it. Oh, I agree. I I agree. I think the pacing is just perfect, um, but I, I what I'm getting at is I can... Yeah. It, it, modern audiences are not used to something this slow, and, you mm. know... Those clo- that series of close-ups on Lambert is just... Uh, that was just a gorgeous shot, I gotta mention. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I mean... There's, there's also, it's just little great details. Uh, the, so we got to talk about this. This is Ash's little dance. <laughs> Every, everybody loves this. Um, and uh, it's, it's like, depending on how you're watching the movie, you know, what, what, of course, if you're watching it in hindsight, you realize he's kind of getting his, you know, machinery running again, okay. but you know, it could also be like, all right, let's do this. Yeah. Know? And they also recycled that dance in the game Alien Isolation for the Working Joes. If it's a kind of an Easter egg, but occasionally, if you just leave them, if you just watch them from a distance, they'll occasionally just do that little dance. Yeah, I was wondering maybe if he was performing for the camera. <laughs> oh, and uh, yeah, and the Ridley Scott moment. just rolled it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be like uh, George C. Scott in uh, Doctor Strange Love. It's, oh, yeah. it's like yeah, just just get all the energy out of the in the first take, and then we'll and then we'll do the real thing, and then he ends up using the over top over the top performance in the movie. So this is something I actually did not learn until recently, very recently. Um, they're spacesuits. I thought they I always thought they were just gray, but they're actually uh, Dallas's spacesuit is pink, and I believe. Um, Lambert's is yellow and Kane's is blue. But because of the lighting, it's hard to tell. But actually, um, uh, apparently those are the colors. Just a fun fact. Like his creative use of a torch. <laughs> we get a little bit of that later too. When he makes the flamethrower. Uh, this is a great scene. I love this. It's just kind of uh, the, the just kind of reminding people these are, these are just like working class people that are you know forced to deal with each other's bullshit and you know this is just like great little banter that would happen normally on the job and I love how they establish Ripley as a figure of authority but mm-hmm. a a good one. Yeah. A really good leader. Oh, and But she's also limited because of, like, she's second in command. Yes. And and also there is the, the feminist angle as well, which is, you know, which really gets played on more in the next movie. It's like, because she's a woman, her, her voice isn't, you know, as, uh, what would you say, well considered as, as others. But actually when... Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Shushet, uh wrote this movie. They actually wrote the cast to be unisex, and you know it could be male, female, whoever. And I believe it was David Geiler and Walter Hill who decided to make Ripley a woman, which was, you know, probably the right choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that gave it a lot of staying power. Yeah, you know, and then her as a character had a lot. She had a lot of staying power because of that. But what's really great about it is, like like you're talking, this is an ensemble cast. So at this point in time, it, they're all kind of uh, equal. Mm-hmm. It, it's really the next movie that really solidifies Ripley as... Uh, like, like I'm not saying that this movie doesn't, you know, solidify Ripley as a great character. But I think the, but I think the next one really kind of puts the, you know, the point on it, so to speak. I love the color palette. Oh yeah, they're down here on the planet, that white light with that blue background, yeah, it's and they're kind of their faces are making a bit of orange. Yeah, very, very eerie, very alien, which I guess is appropriate. Yeah. Is that practical? That must be practical. Yeah. Yeah, the sun. It doesn't look like it'd be too hard. Nah. <laughs> 
No, oh, that's good. I love it. Um, and there's oh, the, that's beautiful. Yeah, there's the derelict. Ash, can you see this? Yes, I can. It's, this was shot with Ridley Scott's uh, personal home video camera. Looks like it. Yeah, and that's great use of video footage. Well, yeah, and because it, it adds a little bit of a distinction because it's like you're thinking, oh, yeah, they're watching it through a monitor. And it's in the story, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, you get this kind of gorgeous, hazy, yeah, uh, grainy footage. Uh, yeah. And, but and, it works. Yeah, it, it, it adds more to the world of the film and makes it look like you're watching it from the character's perspective, which, you know, is... The, part of the genius of all of these movies is how it grounds the the world. Um, going back to the spacesuits a little bit, um, Ridley Scott cites Mobius um, as one of the major creators uh, of uh, of the film's production design. But actually, I I think the only thing of Mobius uh, that ended up was, in the film was the spacesuits. Oh, okay, and. Most of it is Ron Cobb and H.R. Giger. Yeah, I didn't know Mobius worked on that. Yeah. Oh, apparently, uh, he, I think I think he worked on Jodorowsky's Dune. Yeah. And, and he, uh, Giger and he, and Mobius and O'Bannon and were all kind of uh, carryovers from that movie. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Why, have you seen that documentary? No, I haven't. Watch that documentary. Okay. It's amazing how that movie kind of influenced science fiction the unmade movie um god ian holm yeah nothing there's nothing uh freudian about uh, three people walking into a giant vagina <laughs> I, I i love hr giger just as i and so they're going to walk into the giant vagina <laughs> and it's going to be very erotic <laughs> And Ian Holm is this voyeuristic figure who's watching over everybody. It's yeah, and it's again, it's there's that double edge to him. Like he's simultaneous. He, you could view it as he's watching because he's like he wants to see what's going on. Or you could view it as he's trying to find out stuff for the company. Yeah, and he's got this look on his face that's that could really go both ways. Yeah, it's no, fantastic. Yeah, oh, it's 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 really great. Um. We'll talk about it a little bit more, but actually, uh, Dan O'Bannon was not happy with the Ash being a robot thing. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I, of course, think that that was it's one of the best scenes in the movie. Yeah, yeah it's. Yeah. I and again, we'll talk a little bit more about it later. I think it's absolutely vital to the to the film, but um, uh, he uh, was not happy with that actually. Um. So uh, this is, of course, they're in the derelict right now. This uh, this is one of the interesting um, points of the film because Dan O'Bannon was very much into H.P. Lovecraft, and there's something very Lovecraftian about finding this ancient ship and not knowing where it came from or what it's for. And they don't elaborate on it at all, uh, but we might get a we might get a third prequel <laughs> that explains the story for better or worse. Um, this is the shot. The shot coming up here is the one that Ridley fought the studio for. And he said it's the one that's going to show the audience that this is not a B movie. And I, I think it does a pretty good job of that. Uh, to create more of a sense of scale, those are actually Ridley Scott's kids uh, in the spacesuits. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like I said, a lot of great cheap tricks. It is. Yeah. And it absolutely 100% works. Um, yeah, they didn't. They deliberately did not explain the story of what happened to this space jockey, but there's not much you really need to know uh, base, uh, other than what they're going to show. Now, do you think they de gigerfied the ship for Prometheus? The, they made it a little bit more mechanical and less biological, but I, I think it's largely the same. Like I, I, I mean, design-wise, it's it's largely the same. It just felt much more less Giger in Prometheus. Uh, uh, yeah. I don't know how much it looked different. That's well. The big difference is this is much more of a hybrid of organic and mechanical, and yeah. then they little they kind of veered more on the side of the mechanical. 
uh, in Prometheus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and of course, we, this is the foreshadowing here. And again, you didn't need to know anything other than than this. And there's pe- people who don't like Ridley's prequels who think that oh, they're they're either unnecessary or they kind of ruin the mythos. Which I I don't think it really matters all that much. But you know, it's you know, it it it, it is interesting. They they tell you all you need to know just visually with the, his chest broken out and uh, with the uh, the acid. Uh, melting the floor here. Yeah, that's, that's that's all you need. Yeah, I love the space jockey's face. Ah! Kill me! Yeah, that's terrifying. Yeah. No, it's great. Great lighting there, too. Look at that Chiara's girl on um, Ian Holm. What about Ian Hall? The shadow. Oh yeah, yeah. The shadowy, you know, very little bit of light. Oh yeah, coming yeah. In. Keep keeping him in the dark a little bit, a little bit mysterious. Yeah. Um. So yeah, now they're just learning that. Um, or Ripley's realizing, oh, this isn't uh, an SOS. This is actually a warning. Um, which is, <laughs> which <laughs> foreboding. Yeah, and that sets it up in a Hitchcockian kind of way because these people down here, they don't know that it's... Yeah. They didn't hear that. Oh, yeah, yeah. dialogue. We heard it, but... Right, right. Yeah, I mean, it's like Hitchcock said, uh, suspense is the controlled release of information, mm-hmm. and uh, there is kind of an art to that that I think is a little bit lost nowadays. Very deliberate, Yeah, every bit of it in this movie. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, that makes that. But you're absolutely right. That us knowing that now makes the exploration of the ship much more uh, sinister. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know something's gonna pop off. You just don't know when. Yeah. This is uh, this is a gorgeous map uh, map painting. Yeah, oh, that's map painting. I I believe it is. Wow. Yeah. It just it's little thing even in covenant we see like little shots that just kind of add to the scope of the movie but they're very you know in covenant they were green screen obviously and but in 79 they were using matte paintings but they just have that one shot or that or or, you know periodically that just reminds you of the film's scope and i'm gonna psychedelic point of view oh yeah i love it's a great effect it's like you, you don't have to know what it is it's just that's the great thing about something alien in terms of a story is it can be whatever and it doesn't have to like you don't have to know exactly what it is um which maybe that's an argument against prometheus (laughs) but but, um i can i can understand that no i watching this movie i if i i mean i've been very critic i like i've I, I've talked a lot about Prometheus and Covenant. I've been critical of it, but even though I, I I ultimately like the movies and I'm not as like, you know, I, I, I don't know if you can just ruin a franchise with, with one film necessarily. No, I, I, I don't think so, but I do under, I, I can understand people's complaints oh, about Prometheus. Oh, a hundred percent. I Covenant, I, I can't. I love Covenant. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I understand where people are coming from too, but, you know, you still have this movie. So. Yeah. So, uh, oh my God. Yeah, this is great. I think. Yeah. I think. Uh, yeah. So this is another one. This is Ridley Scott with some rubber uh, dishwashing <laughs> gloves. It, yeah, this is because <laughs> that's that's very memorable. That pulsing on that egg. Yeah, it's just him yeah. just kind of fluttering some rubber yellow r- rubber gloves. Wow. It, yeah, it's brilliant. Ugh. Yeah, it works, right? Gives you the creeps. Yeah. As um, the one guy as the mm-hmm. what's his name? Black guy. <laughs> Damn it, Justin. It, Yafiat Koto. Well, Yafiat Koto says later. Yeah. So uh, here we're seeing uh, this is a sheep stomach, I think. They just went down to the butcher and got the discarded uh, remains. And there, it's an alien. <laughs> right. Surprise! Uh, 
It was their first big jump scare and gave half the country a heart attack. Yeah, well, there's complete silence before and after that. Well, you get a little bit of the... You hear a little bit of the pulsing from the egg. Yeah. Yeah, but it's... It's it, very quiet, though. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. very deliberate. Like, we haven't yes. really heard any major, like, sounds in a while, except for maybe the wind and the noises from the ship. Do you know how long into the movie we are? Uh, now that that face hugger jumped? Uh, I actually don't. Okay. I, I, I don't feel like stopping it. I don't know. No. Um... So, I was just curious because it's been a while since this movie started, and that was really the yeah. first bit of action. Yeah, I think that that's the end of Act One, right? Yes. You know, now we're in Act Two. Um, so um, they're they're dragging Kane in. Kane has just been uh, has just been face hugged, and um, Ripley is denying them in. Um, and that doesn't make any sense to me, because as we learned in 2020, uh, people do not follow quarantine procedures. Well, 24 whole hours for decontamination. Come on. It's like, yeah. I, and that's not, yeah. <laughs> how, how can anybody deal with that? That doesn't make yeah. any sense. Oh, and here's and, Ian Holm. And, and, yeah, this is, you know, really kind of the first major point where... Um, if you know what if you know what's gonna happen with Ian Holm, this is like this is a this is a dead giveaway. But well, if you don't, well, I mean, we had the little discussion between Ash and Ripley earlier, but that's the first big moment where Ash and Ripley are established as like protagonist and antagonist. Uh huh. And Ash does something, yeah, deliberately that will, mm -hmm. you know, cause the rest of the movie to happen. <laughs> yeah. And they and so here's the thing is like people in Prometheus is like where they take their helmets off they could get a, a parasite attached to them and like well I mean obviously the helmet didn't help uh, John Hurt <laughs> oh that's great oh, oh that's great and choking oh, oh I love it it's great so we were talking earlier in the director's cut um, there's a little bit more of an argument going on between Dallas and Kane and the people in the hallway here and it actually lends a completely different energy to the scene like this it's more focused on the face hugger and how do we get it off but then there's in the director's cut there's a little bit more of a sense of urgency and panic um, because they get uh, Ripley makes it clear that she's really pissed off that Ash broke quarantine procedures Try to get his finger off. I'll do the fingering. <laughs> oh, uh, this is so good. I love this. It's so gross. And very deliberate camera. I, I, I mean, every time. I, I. I I don't remember who was the director of photography on this movie, but I, I mean, it, it's it's solid. It's uh -huh. solid cinematography. A lot of that's really Scott. No, he always knows. Yeah. You know what yeah. he wants to do from the beginning. You yeah, know? and he's he's very good at communicating what he wants because if you like, this movie was originally seven million dollars, and Ridley drew out some very intense deliberate storyboards and when the studio saw it they doubled the budget to 14 million wow so it's like that's the power of having really good storyboards for all you filmmakers listening yeah wow yeah. there's that cheap video again yeah and again it's like you don't need to do much you just lay some cheap intestine and film it with a home video yeah it's that texture yeah. You get out of that videotape, though. Yeah. It's... So, uh, here's another little fun, back, fun fact. Uh, an actual fun fact this time. Uh, <laughs> Alien uh, originally was going to be done by Roger Corman. Wow. And uh, Roger Corman was going to do it for a million dollars. And he says, well, how are you going to do the face hugger? Oh, yeah, we'll just go out to the deli and we'll get, like, some bologna or something. And we'll just slap <laughs> it on his face. <laughs> Eric, Roger Corman, I, I love Roger Corman, but I'm I'm kind of happy that this ended up not being a Roger Corman movie. Yeah. 
for the best. Roger Corman, of course, did the ripoff Galaxy of Terror uh, the very next year after this movie. So, the acid blood scene. Yeah, so this is a great scene, and this is a great plot device because it, 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 it's. You're, you first have the question of how does the alien get on the ship? Oh, okay, it's going to screw the guy in the face and put it put something inside him. Okay, but why don't they just tear it off his face? Well, he's got acid blood, and that's genius because when you're in a spaceship, having something that could bleed and put a hole in the ship um, is it forces you to be really creative with how you're actually going to kill this thing. And... It's it's a much um, it, it's much easier or, or excuse me it's 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 much more creative than uh, it's like oh it's bulletproof or whatever and it is so well communicated visually yeah that acid blood and, and you know by the the way that the actors are responding to it as well like this is serious like this could put a hole in a uh, a hole in the in the ship Ugh, I was trying to say a uh, a hole in the hull of the ship. Um, yeah, that's a great shot. Yep. And upcoming here is one of the best character moments yep. in the whole oh, movie. Oh, yeah, I love this. I love this bit. Yeah. This got a big laugh when we saw this in the theater. Oh, yeah. And it's so small, such a small moment. Yeah, yeah, I love You know the one I'm talking about. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you know, yeah I know what you're talking about. It's like, like half a second. Yeah, any, any second now. We're building up. Yeah, here's yeah. your pen back. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's great. That's, just little more, face. Just, just breaking the tension. <laughs> little moments like that. It, and it's so perfectly executed. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely... Like I said, I, I almost feel like this kind of filmmaking is a little bit lost in, in major blockbuster films. Yeah. Yep. Um, again, a, a lot of there's some really good interplay here between uh, uh, Yafiat Koto and uh, Harry Dean Stanton. Um, this is a comic relief duo. Yeah, Yafiat Koto is great. Yeah. And you see, and when he gets to when he gets the opportunity in the end to be a hero, that's yeah. he, brilliant. He kept on arguing with Ridley Scott about the end. He kept on wanting to change the ending so that he ends up killing the alien at the end. <laughs> and Ridley Scott uh, noted that he was like, "He's driving me crazy." This is like, no. Uh, if I were in his position, I'd be trying to get to be the one who kills the alien i mean hell yeah it's badass and with an ensemble cast i mean it's possible but in the end of the day it's going to ripley and that was and this is one of the films that codified the slasher trope of the final girl right i, I think halloween came out the fall of uh, the year before this yeah. so yeah, I think Roger Ebert called Alien... Oh, he actually criticized Alien initially. He's like, it's just a slasher film in space. And I'm like... Hey, so they just they just capitalized on the existence you know, of Halloween and the existence of Star Wars. But, but, but that's also why it's good. It's such a beautifully simple concept. Like, that's not... That simplicity isn't something to scoff at. It's actually... Mm -hmm very difficult to get to that point like people don't realize that and there is all that and he used they use that premise halloween in space as a way to have all this great uh production design well actually actually the it really said was jaws in space that works yeah that, yeah that was his pitch yeah and the studio's like here's 14 million uh and of course after star wars came out um it's interesting if you look at sci-fi in the 70s it was kind of dying out and it was really star wars that brought sci-fi back in a big way and after star wars was a thing every studio in town was looking for quick get me the next spaceship movie and again sitting on alan ladd's desk was a little script called alien and they're like i didn't know alan ladd produced did he produce it? He didn't produce it, but he was like the head of the studio at the time. Oh, wow. Alan Ladd or Alan Ladd Jr. Um, so, and this is a great line here, and you let him in. It, it's just like a really great 
like drawing a line in the sand between these characters. Yeah. And you know, we get a little bit of exposition about the alien, but then we also get the escalating tension between Ripley and Ash. And yeah. And what would you have done with Kane? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. It's things like this that I are part of the reason why I, I kind of look down upon the drama in, in Covenant because it's like the the at best the the Covenant drama is very um, it, it's 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 very limited. It's it's like giving you just enough of what you need, but it doesn't feel very fully fleshed out. But this movie feels. What? Every character in this has a an a reason for everything they're doing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. and there's actual like conflict. Like it's not. It doesn't feel manufactured. It feels like something that would naturally. You know, this was this is a natural conversation that would come up, and that's great. That's genius. That's what that's what storytelling is about. There's another TV screen. So it just shoved a TV inside the miniature. I I had a note like um I do you know what song is playing here? Did you did you know? Yeah, I I don't know either. Maybe it'll show up in the credits. It's a little bit of uh, Idris Elba's character in this a little bit. You, you see later. Now, this is a great edit, cause you're like. Oh shit! All you need to mm -hmm. do is see his face and be like, "Where's the fucking alien?" Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, and yeah, this uh, this scene here, this scene, um, this goes on a little while, and it really, really plays on the audience's like imagination, <laughs> like mm -hmm. where the where the did that alien go and what is it gonna do and another great use of silence yeah here oh yeah this, it, it yeah and actually there's uh it, it's playing its beats perfectly because we got something else coming up in a, in a few seconds here uh but yeah right right now it's just it's just the silence and again kind of going back to the idea of the alien like what is it supposed to be we have no idea and that's scary as hell because you don't know mm -hmm. what the fuck this thing is gonna do yeah <laughs> yeah just this long take and the deep oh, focus yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah there's the beat right there yeah and then it, they use that to make um a jump to more close-up shots um so we get more into the actual character perspective but they dwell on that long take for a while um because they they want you to really be thinking for yourself a little bit like mm -hmm. oh god where is it and ian holmes every movement is so deliberate well, yeah, and it's like, if you're looking at it in hindsight, like... Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's like, he's, um, you know, he's also kind of curious about this thing because he's trying to figure out stuff for the company. Dude, he's got a hard-on for the alien. You think so? Oh, yeah. I, I think really Scott said androids just do not have genitalia. Oh, well, he fucking loves that's, that That's thing. why he goes... <gasps> oh! Ah! Ah! Excuse me, miss, would you like to hear about our Lord and Savior? Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's great. And I think that's just seafood. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think it's like oysters and Could shit. Be a crab painted white. Oh, well, I, I think the, well, I mean, the alien is like, you know, whatever plaster or whatever, but uh, not plaster, but oh, inside yeah. here, yeah, but yeah, oh. I'm talking about its guts here, yeah. And uh, James Cameron redesigned uh, the underside of the face hugger for aliens, so it's a little bit more 
looks a little bit more like uh, genitalia. Oh, okay. Which is a little bit more Giger esque. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a that's just straight up yeah. an oyster. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Cheap tricks. Yeah, oh, exactly. It's great because you don't need to think about it too much. It's mm-hmm. just like, okay, yeah, it's an alien, whatever. Uh, that's kind of the genius of it. So, yeah, now, uh, yeah, Dallas is kind of this... Um, little bit of a devil may care character and ripley's the one that's actually taking this really seriously and Mm -hmm. this is kind of when she starts to take over as the hero of the story yeah that and her conflict with ash yeah well now this started earlier yeah you know but this is like you know dallas is just kind of like like okay he's a science officer just let him do science and and she's like you're you're not you don't you don't see anything that's wrong with this and that's our that's an interesting little hint there. It's like yeah, he they replaced whoever we were supposed to be with Ash like two days before we left. So there's our kind of first hint that I didn't catch that. Yeah, yeah it's just a quick little moment. Uh, our first hint that Ash is Ash is sus for all you uh, Among Us players out there, all you kids in your Twitch. And the exteriors of the ship are so rare, but every time they look good. Yeah. And this film was nominated for its production design. It did not... I forget what it lost to, but um, it deservedly got the visual effects um, uh, Oscar. And and so did Aliens. Actually, Aliens won... I, I think Aliens was nominated for six awards, and I think it got... At least two. We got visual effects and I think sound. Okay. The sound in this movie is fantastic. Every time oh, yeah, you hear that ship going. Yeah, yeah. It's... No, it, you know it's. There's a little bit of music. Very rare. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very brilliantly done. Uh, everything is very brilliantly done and very deliberate. Um, Again, Jerry Goldsmith was not happy with the way his score was used. He actually had a little bit... There was a lot of um, the weird stuff, obviously, the scary stuff, but then there was also a lot of a sense of wonder originally, and a lot of that wondrous stuff got cut um, because it wasn't, the t- it wasn't the eerie tone, and he just wasn't happy with that. I'd, would you agree with this, that Alien is a horror movie first and a science fiction movie second? Um, that's a, that's a good question. And I think it, it, it's, if we're going back to like story, yes, it's a horror movie first, but it's in the, you know, it's in the dressing of science fiction. Um, Mm -hmm. but I think it's just as valid of a science fiction film as it is a horror film. Yeah. I'd agree with that. Yeah. This scene gets a lot of laughs too. Oh um, yeah, yeah the uh, right. Yeah, Harry Dean Stanton. Yeah. And Yafayat. Yafayat. Yeah. It's yeah. uh. <clears throat> yeah, it's just a little bit of um again just breaking up the tension and I I I know I keep saying it I just didn't realize how many funny moments there are in this movie until I saw it with an audience. And Ash is saying, "Come see King." So Ash is kind of a dick, and I'm not just talking overall, but it's just like he's like he couldn't just say, uh, "Yeah, Kane's awake." Yeah, <laughs> but of course it it's more interesting if you, um, yeah. Only somebody had suggested that they quarantine him. Yeah, if only then maybe none of this wouldn't <laughs> would have happened. <laughs> There's Ash drinking something. Yeah. Ash drinking something? Oh, he, he had a cup in his hand when he was walking away there. Oh. We'll see it again later on. Well, I mean, androids in the alien universe do eat and drink. But they must not be able to digest all of it. I think they do. So what happened? They, and how does it come out of skin? I, I think they... I, I'd have to look into how it. How did the milk come out of skin then? 
Well, it's his blood. I thought that was the milk he was drinking earlier. No, no, that's android blood. Oh. No, I thought they set him up drinking milk for that reason. No, no, it's... Uh, 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 in fact, I will point that out when we get there, but it is it is his blood. Okay. Um, so this is the famous scene that everybody knows. Um, there's a lot of misunderstanding about it because the, uh, there's an urban myth of sorts that the cast and crew didn't know what was going to happen and that's just not true because they read the script and they saw the special effect being set up. Um, what they didn't really know was that um, how much blood was actually going to be shooting out and uh, poor Veronica Cartwright got hit with a huge jet of blood and we'll see a a bit of that in this and she had no idea that that was going to happen but um the, the, you couldn't have kept this big moment hidden from the from, oh, from the cast the acting is so good from john hurt here yeah he really sells it and uh it's an ash ashes ashes sus so so they so this is this is a funny moment because they think he might be having a seizure so they're putting something in his mouth to prevent him from biting his tongue but i don't think you're actually supposed to do that anymore just a fun fact i know you gotta make sure they don't bite their tongue <laughs> I, I think you're not supposed to stick stuff in their mouth though okay I, I i don't think that's a thing anymore uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like little beat yeah. there. Uh, it's like, whoa, whoa, what the, uh, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. The, ed the editing world. of the scene. Oh, yeah, my there God. she is. Yeah. Hello, my baby. Hello, my honey. Hello, copyright strike. <laughs> Mazel top. It's a boy. Yeah, uh, it's great. Um, See, Ian Holm freaking loves that thing. Look at it. Yeah, I know he's, he's he's yeah. It's a magnificent specimen. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, who saw that coming in 1979? I, I don't know. The um the marketing for this movie was fairly limited and um they didn't show all i don't think they even really showed much of the alien at all um so wasn't the tagline in space nobody can hear you scream yep that's that was, the famous tagline yeah, that was great but it, it, i think the first trailer for this it was wasn't really showing much of anything so it um you know i'm audiences probably went into this movie almost clueless you know, and that's kind of, that's kind of great. I wonder how much word of mouth really helped this movie. Because it, it feels like, it seems like one of those that people would be talking about. Oh, yeah. It was, I for mean, a this, while after they see it. You know, I mean, it was a, it was a pretty big hit. Um, so the, the crew had a fun time uh, shooting this uh, here. They did like 50 takes of that. Really? Yeah, just shooting. It's just It was really simple to set up. It's just like, okay, yeah, put it back in. We'll shoot it out again. And they just did a whole bunch of takes of it. And I'm like, that was that was fun. Cool. Shot it in uh, high speed, slow motion. High speed uh, paradoxically creates slow motion for those who are not aware. That's a great miniature shot. I think Ridley Scott actually... Um, when he was going in to approve the model of the Nostromo refinery, I think he actually like was unhappy about something. He just straight up and bro broke a piece off of it and said, <laughs> this is garbage. <laughs> like, Ridley Scott, this is only your second feature film. His first one was The Duelists, and I think before that he was mainly doing commercials. Have you seen The Duelists? I have not. Have you? No. Yeah, I, I want to see it. Yeah, no, I love Ridley Scott. I would love to see it. It's with Harvey Keitel. I think so. I'm not sure. I um I like this bit here because th this is just th 
they just have the sound effect of it detecting the motion. It doesn't do anything. It's just a prop. It's but, just a box with a thing yeah, sticking out. Yeah, of yeah, it. It, yeah. But they 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 sell it with the with the sound effects. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's smart. Yeah, it's great. And you don't have, and there was a moment earlier where they were just looking at some, some numbers on a screen and, uh, just talking about, it's like, oh yeah, it looks like it's a combination of oxygen, nitrogen. It's like, I don't know what the fuck those numbers mean. <laughs> and you don't have to, that's kind of the brilliant thing about science fiction. You can just get You don't know how, have to know how something works. You just kind of have to feel like it makes sense. Here's when they start hunting for the alien. Yeah. They're, uh, they're looking for it with the motion tracker and, this is another long shot, slightly, uh, slightly wobbly camera, uneasy. Again, and that lens flare, the yeah. massive lens. Yeah, lens this flare. was J.J. Abrams' first, first time shooting a movie. <laughs> don't don't put J.J. in charge of an alien movie if you're. Oh, that, that would be a mess. Yeah, I I don't think I'd like that very much. I don't mind J.J. Abrams, but I don't think he'd be a good fit for Alien. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, so this, uh, again, this kind of goes on a little bit while. They really draw out the um, the pacing on things. and Oh, my God. This this whole scene is great because, it. As you can, you'll see in a minute, it's a fake out. Yeah, but it's yeah. sold so well up until that point. Yeah, because your imagination is all over the place. Like, where did this thing go? Where the hell is it? It could be anywhere, literally. Uh, I think, though, and I, I don't remember if I mentioned this earlier, but it was like one of the big differences between the director's cut and the theatrical cut is the director's cut really tightens up the pacing a little bit more and gets more in it really gets the things a little bit quicker which is you know maybe for some people that um might work a little bit better for them i like the longer scenes because of the tension oh i you know no i i i agree i think it's stretching the I, I, rubber band before you let go yeah i think the pacing on this film is you know perfect i'm just i'm just kind of looking at it from the perspective of like you know does the movie still hold up to today's audience uh, to t today's standards and i think for the most part it absolutely does but you know i i think you know we you know in the interest of fairness it's like you know are there some things that maybe feel a little bit out of touch for a modern audience maybe I'd say it's above today's. It's too far above today's standards to no, I, appeal to a modern audience. I, 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 yeah, I, I agree. I do agree. I just it does everything too well. <laughs> People aren't used to that anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, I, it, it, it's just I, I look at it just from the perspective. It's like, you know, again, does does that pacing actually translate? Maybe, but here we I are. wish people would go back to this. Though, so. yeah, I agree. So here's the. They think they found it here, and it's ah, it's the cat. And uh, little Jonesy. Yeah, little Jonesy. And Harry Dean Stanton here smiling. Well, oh, he's just. <laughs> It's it's just like one of these things where he's got to be one of the actors who's had the most fun career. Yeah, because you know he was in uh, Repo Man. What else was he in? Um, Twin Peaks. <laughs> oh, was it? Yeah, see, I didn't watch the Straight. Twin... I think he was in the Straight Story. Okay, I didn't. I didn't watch Twin Peaks. Um, uh, he was in the movie of Twin Peaks and the reboot. Oh, okay. not the original series. He had that cameo in the Avengers for some reason. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! <laughs> I haven't seen the Avengers. Yeah, I was just, awesome. I, yeah, I was like, oh, is that Harry Dean Stanton playing the janitor? And I, and people were like <laughs> applauding when he showed up, and I'm like, is this like a? I, I mean, I I know it's Harry Dean. Dude, Stanton. everybody loves Harry uh, Dean Stanton. Uh, I, I was gonna can't deny. I, I mean, that's the thing. It's a. I know it's Harry Dean Stanton, but I'm like, is this like a Joss Whedon in joke that I'm not aware of? I, uh, 
I I don't know. <laughs> I don't really care that much for Joss Whedon. Well, he was in The Godfather. Harry or The Jean's... Godfather 2. Yeah. yeah. Oh, was he? It's been a while since I've seen those movies. Small part, but... Yeah. He's always... He always stands out. Oh, have you seen Paris, Texas? I have not. That's a great movie with him. Let the check it out. Um, of course, though, we, we realize um, Harry Dean Stan. Th- this is Harry Dean Stan going to die. <laughs> like, yeah. The moment you go off alone and you're in a big room. Uh-huh. Um, Except it, he keeps seeing the cat, you it, know, which makes you think, it, you know, it's kind of a it, yeah, it's, it's, fake out that that's the only thing that's going to happen in this room, you know? That's what they try to get you to believe. But. Right, yeah. Oh, but here we go. Uh, that little reveal of information. Yeah. You know? And it's like, yeah, it's, again, kind of like, ignoring the quarantine procedures once more. And that just looks like a thing, a, a couple condoms wrapped together. <laughs> it's, uh, I think the alien spent a little bit too long in the sun. I was just curious how they actually made that skin, because it looked like that or rubber gloves or something. Um, I'm not sure, but... Uh, Real cheap. Yeah, no, they did. Could s- not have cost too much to make that. Yeah, there was, a, speaking of condoms, there was a lot of KY jelly on the set of this movie. Oh, yeah. People are having all sorts of yeah, fun. Yeah, people just getting it on. <laughs> yeah, not not since uh, Salo, the 120 Days of Sodom, have people had more fun on a set of a movie. <laughs> Look that one up, kids. Uh, <laughs> Um, so this is an interesting bit, uh, Ridley Scott, um, the, the water that's dripping down from, uh, from the ceiling, actually Ridley, according to Ridley Scott, uh, the ship is so big, it has an atmosphere at the very top, so this is actually supposed to be rain, and... So this isn't part of the refinery? I guess it not. Okay, Uh, I, I don't know how much I yeah. buy the idea that the atmosphere was on the surface, but it is, it is, kind of it is cool visually that there's just like water dripping down. Oh yeah, I mean I can imagine it being part of the you know the refinery. I guess now that you mention it, that makes sense. But you know, did they go off into like it? it like are, that's a good question. Is he still on the ship? I don't know. Yeah. Um, so in the, uh, director's cut of the film, we see a little bit more of the alien in this scene, which is interesting. Now, I love this. You see in the background, you see kind of the chain. Yeah, the chain, yep. Uh, And then, uh, they do it a cut here and then you cut back and, uh, (gasps) yeah, there it is. Uh, So scary. Uh, Ah, there it is. Such a scary moment. Yeah. And they don't really give you a great look at the creature. There's just kind of this close up here, but that's not telling you everything you need to know. Um, or telling you everything about it, I should say. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, and you see his reaction. Yeah. That's, Come give Granny a kiss. That's what really sells it is his terrified face there. Now, here's an edit, and I wanted to ask you this question, if this works or not. Um, so, in the, and I believe it's in the director's cut, um, they had uh, Yafiat Koto and uh, Sigourney Weaver rushing into the room at the end and seeing Brett get taken away by the alien. Now, for pacing reasons, they just cut to them at the table talking about, uh, talking. it's like, they're talking as if they've seen it, even though... It wasn't clear if they saw it or not. Do you mm-hmm. think? Do you think it, this that still works? I worked? think this works in the theatrical cut. You think so? But I'm, I fell asleep before I reached that part <laughs> of the director's cut last night. Okay. Well, so it, I couldn't tell you how well that worked. Well, I'm, I, I, I guess I'm just saying it's like, is it because they are speaking as if like they actually did see the creature? Like, uh, Kodo is gonna say here in a second, the son of a bitch is huge. It's like a man. It's big. Yeah, right here. So it's. I guess I would have liked to see a. P- I guess a POV shot does make it make more sense, but you buy it anyway. Yeah, it's you know, you kind of maybe infer some things. Yeah, your mind fills in the blanks there that weren't yeah. there for time. 
Yeah, I, I mean, it's like it's it's a question of continuity versus pacing, really. Um, and in a movie that's really based on the pacing, um, I can see that being, you know, a fair choice. Oh yeah, I would take pacing over continuity, just about every time. I'd have to see it on a case by case basis, but I think in this case, I, I I think they probably did the right thing. But you know, just a couple of things about that. So another interesting thing is like um, there's a mention there. Can you rig an incinerator unit, which implies that the flamethrower they have earlier is just kind of you know slapped together from various parts but in other alien franchise things like alien isolation that's an actual like incinerator unit and it's mm. like one of those things where it's like it's kind of like lightsabers in in star wars a little bit like it's it's feels initially like a makeshift device but oh no actually it's the official jedi tool oh. it, like that yellow color that you know the it's changed to yeah the white you yeah. know it was the white had a more bluish hue to it earlier like like for what in a lot of the in a few of the scenes inside the ship the white backgrounds would have a oh. bluer hue oh. to them well sure yeah but here in mother you see it's yeah the white has turned yellow also mother sucks as I don't know if you noticed this, but it's like he's asking all these questions, and Mother's like, "Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about." I thought that was because Ian Holm well, did something to it. Well, it is. Okay, it is. I'm just kind of like, you know, who designed this computer system? <laughs> um, but it actually is a great moment because we realize Dallas is going into the ventilation shaft and. He has that little moment with Mother where he's trying to figure out, okay, what am I up against? And Mother doesn't have an answer for him. And he's just, again, there's that devil may care aspect to his character where he's just like, okay, guess we're going in and I'm the captain. So I, I hold this responsibility to, you know, to my crew in a way. But I like that use of a camera yeah. aperture oh. as a door. Yeah. Oh, the yeah. That, that I love that, and I also like how it closes. You know, you know, we see him kind of disappear behind it a little bit. It's it's foreshadowing. It almost makes a uh, iris on the screen. It does. Yeah. But yeah. I'm just saying, like from a visual storytelling perspective, it's it's very much. Um, you know, it's kind of foreshadowing. Okay, he's he's disappearing into these vents. Um, he's going into unknown territory, but also hinting it's like, yeah, he's he's on his own now. You know, this is possibly my favorite scene in the movie. I um, I love the climax of this scene so much. It's one of the scariest scenes ever put to film ow my eye like the flashing yellow light on Ripley's face there adds to the atmosphere of the whole thing oh, yeah. you know, it makes the ship look bigger oh, yeah. having little bits of light here and there bits of shadow well, yeah, and it's just little stuff that sometimes it, it it's not even just a matter of storytelling per se, but it it's just a matter of you know making the shot a little bit more interesting. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it is you know we're telling a story. Yeah, the this is. This is scary. You're in the, this. You're in this cramped space, looking for this thing, and you know, not knowing exactly what you're gonna find. I like to mention about that scene where he was trying to communicate with Mother, and there's another one where Sigourney Weaver goes in and oh yeah, tries that's... to do the same thing. Coming up later. I just like to mention uh, a certain aspect of that scene, but we'll talk about that after. Sure. This. 
Oh yeah, sure. Well, you know, it's when Dallas kind of gets picked off as that's what gives uh, Ripley access to to the mother computer that she didn't have before. Be a great use of this, yeah, little screen there. No, I, I, so we completely understand what's going on, and it's all visual. Yeah, there's some of that KY. Oh yeah, yeah aliens having a little bit of fun. Uh, <laughs> but no, this is actually this. Like I said, this is my favorite scene of the movie. This is terrifying. It's it's like Lambert's like saying it should be there. It's got to be there, and it's like we don't see it. <laughs> And he's like, oh, okay, this is this is what's gonna this is this is where I die. This is where my story ends. And he's just like panicking, and then uh oh, mm-hmm. oh god, Ugh. and intercutting those three places: the uh, computer screen and and, and Lambert's and voice him. in the scene. Get out of there! It's coming right towards you. Yeah, oh. yeah. Ah, uh, the uh, ashes, son of a bitch. <laughs> Happy birthday, bitch! <laughs> yep. You well, only see the alien for how long? You think half a second, quarter in, of in a that second? scene? Yeah. Yeah. Half a second at most, and it, and it is a little bit goofy because you can see it's a guy in a suit, you know. Going, Surprise! <laughs> but, but, oh, that close up on Lam- uh its Lambert, right? Yeah, that's yeah. Lambert. Yeah, and th- this is a part where people like hate Lambert for some reason. Uh, fun fact: I, I actually think I I don't know if this was something they decided during Alien, but. It, I think it actually is canon and uh, that Lam- Lambert's actually supposed to be transgender. I don't again, I don't know if that was something they decided on this film, but I, I think it actually like is he JK Rowling now or so? Hey, no, she doesn't know it ever. Well, I, I mean, if she wasn't intended to be, then yeah, she did kind of get JK Rowling. It's, it'd be kind of like Ridley Scott, you know, years later saying, Well, actually, it was always my intention that the alien was gay. <laughs> Um, I'm just, uh, I just think that... I remember you mentioning that. I just, I don't quite buy it. Yeah, 100%. I, you know? I, I I think it's, it's actually a auxiliary because it's in Aliens, in the boardroom scene when we're looking at, uh, like where they're showing all the screens of all the people on the Nostromo who died. They wrote out all that information, even though it's not like, we it's don't not even we don't really see it really visible but but yeah. if you actually look at the screens it, it actually there's something mentioned in there Lambert is was uh, transgender I, whether she was male to female or female to male I don't remember yeah that's what I'm yeah that's I, what I'm having trouble with yeah. yeah I I don't know it does it doesn't matter it's just an interesting no, yeah it's just an interesting point um so now we're kind of seeing Ripley um you know, really kind of uh, become more the authority figure here. And uh, Ash kind of is realizing, okay, the jig is up a little bit. Like, okay, she's going to find out about what's really happening. What a great performance. Yeah. Every time I see him. Yeah, and this is, I, this is great staging, too. Oh, yeah. yeah back, back to her, and it's like... He he knows that she's gonna find out, and that off center, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lambert there, yeah, and I love this scene here with uh, with Parker, <laughs> just being the action hero. It's just, and it's something that and I like that he's got a little gut, yeah. <laughs> but but it's also this thing where it's it's a little bit funny, but it's also something you would totally do in that situation. Uh-huh. It's such at least someone like him. Well, like nobody in the movie really looks like an action hero oh absolutely you know? no and it, that's deliberate and yeah. that's yeah i wouldn't it's actually an interesting thing in um in the next movie we'll talk a little bit because a lot of people complain about the action movie aesthetic of aliens and i don't know if that's something i necessarily agree with too much well like this like i'd say that this is a horror movie first i would say that aliens is an action movie 
it first. I, I I wouldn't disagree with that, but I would say Aliens. If it, Aliens is an action movie, it's 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 a very unconventional action movie. So here's the scene where she's uh, communicating with Mother. I just wanted to mention uh, sort of a level of this scene that is like a prayer, and the way that technology has replaced God in the future. You know, you're relying on this oh, thing, I... and then when you need it. Well, it if, can't communicate. It's not communicating with you. Well, if we're gonna say that, then we're saying that Ripley is like telling God, "You, you hey, you better tell me what the fuck's going on." <laughs> well, yeah, she's in a desperate moment. Yeah, but, yeah. but but would you say that to God? I don't know. I, I don't know if people can just do that. I mean, that you can. Well, I but... think that that's that's what I mean, though. It's like a loss of faith. Well, it, out well, in space. You know, oh, you can't. You oh, can't do that. Oh, oh, well, I know that well, doesn't work. Well, I can see that. Like yeah. Ridley's, or uh, Ripley's, like uh, losing faith in yeah. in technology. Yeah, that's what that's what I mean. Yeah. Right. No. No. In that sense, I I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I all... think the way that they, you know, when they're in their tough moment, they go mm-hmm. in to try to talk to this thing. Oh yeah, yeah. No. You know, you know what I mean. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't think of that way before. You know, they're in an incredibly. But but Tough so spot. so we saw there that she slammed Ash against the wall. This is why I'm pointing out later. So she her she's got a nosebleed because uh, you know I I didn't don't know if she got hit or or something. Or, but or she's just stressed out. Uh, but we see her blood uh, here, and then we're gonna see Ash's blood in a second. And I think that's deliberate. We're supposed to think of his uh, the white liquid as being Ash's blood, and that's like. Oh fuck! What's wrong with him? You know, is he infected by the alien or something? Like, see, there's him, and then there's uh, there's hers. I I think that was a very deliberate touch. You see what I mean? Hmm. But yeah, okay. yeah. Ash is like, okay, jig is up. <laughs> oh, he grabbed out a chunk of her hair. Yeah, uh, that's raw. Yeah, uh, this scene is one of the most horrifying scenes yeah. in the movie. Like, this might be, like, the most horrifying scene in the movie, uh, in my opinion. And this is something that, um, again, Dan O'Bannon was not happy with this story moment. Um, it was uh, originally written by... Because uh, the way that um, David Geiler... Uh, David Geiler and Walter Hill actually rewrote the script. And they added this moment in here where it was revealed Ash was a robot plant by the company. Um, but before I continue that, we gotta talk about this. This is fucked up. Like, you don't know what's happening, but you know it's really, really wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and... Um, uh, and it, I think Fastbender uh, channels that in a uh, Alien Covenant. A hundred percent. When he attacks uh, Catherine Waterson. Yeah, but but he doesn't try to shove a magazine in her Doesn't in her he mouth. Stick his hand in her. No. I, I. No, I don't think he so. I think he tried to kiss her, but. Okay. But he didn't. This is. Uh, yeah. Uh, but Dan O'Bannon was very unhappy because he's like, I just wanted to make a monster movie and they had to go ahead and put like an anti-corporate message in my film. <laughs> and I'm looking at it like the movie needed to have something. The, we needed to have something else following the chestburster scene, like the next, like what's the next big shock of this film? And this is it. And... Oh. Yeah, right here. He's an android. Um, I I think this is one hundred percent vital because it, we just it's just another like major beat in the story that I think we would be missing uh, without. Yeah. Um, but it does it does add a um kind of a uh, a commentary on the film about the role that major corporations play in our lives. And um, Dan O'Bannon, for some reason, was just... He didn't like that. (laughs) This is... This is really freaky. (laughs) Yeah. Uh... Um, and kind of going into the H.R. Giger stuff, it's like the, I like the interpretation of androids in, uh, 
in the Alien universe because they're kind of like a mix of mechanical and biological. That's H.R. Giger. H.R. Giger worked on the android? I don't think he worked on the android per se, but I'm saying they're kind of channeling, yeah. channeling like it's His not kind of philosophy. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's, it's kind. It's not just gears or whatever. It's yeah. it's actually like a living thing to an extent. Oh, and this cheap trick coming uh, up here. Is yeah. Oh, one the, of the way the this most is sta- spectacular things. Yeah, this is staged well. If I'm, this is one of the the things that you were talking about earlier. Yes. Yeah. That this yes. edit doesn't work. <laughs> no. 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 I was saying this is one of the this is one of the cheap tricks that I that so, I thought sold no 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 sold. no 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 the the editing this staging that we're looking at right now that's this is brilliant this works I was just talking about like the actual cut that was there oh I didn't I didn't really have a problem I'm too invested I think in seeing this cheap trick here no this, where he's got his head sticking up out of the bottom out no, of the tape no this is great <laughs> it's is so good no this is this is brilliant i'm talking yeah, about like talking about they should have made like a a cut to somebody else's face and then cut to that okay um other because the jump is a little bit jarring and okay but it's not a big no, deal i didn't have a problem with that it, it's not a big deal yeah. it's really not it's not a big deal but it but damn that special that special effect is so cheap well, it's and so brilliant, and, and we need to emphasize when we say cheap, we're not. We're it's not, simple. Yeah, we're yeah we're not yeah. we're not saying that in a derogatory way. No, it, it's the, to get to a simple, like way of doing things is honestly when it comes to filmmaking, that's actually not as easy as people would think. Mm-hmm. It, you know, you have to work really hard to get to that point, and. Yeah, you have to. He had. They had to write the entire scene around a head sticking out of a table. Yeah, you know they didn't. You know they couldn't. Yeah, just put that in a movie. Yeah, exactly. Um, but you know these are the visual effects and and figuring out how to best accomplish them and mm. the way they went about it is just it's really smart. It's just really simple, um, and it's it's got Ian Holm and then it's got another actor obviously playing the uh the arm oh yeah uh, i i think it has to be right that can't be that can't be ian holm because the the hand was moving so that's not a fake that is somebody's arm oh and that's and then the body is the the fake ian holm from earlier yeah yeah so yeah, so the uh, company wants the alien for their bioweapons division. Mm-hmm. And that was all... I, I mentioned this before. But I always thought that was a little bit weird. <laughs> like, where the, But I, it, I, I could be wrong, but I have a feeling it, when or if we get the next alien prequel, it's going to be revealed that the, uh, the company actually wanted the alien because they know it has a connection to the black goo. And the black goo is the bioweapon that the company wants. Oh. That's my theory. That's interesting. Time could prove me wrong, but that's what I... that That's kind of what I'm thinking. Um, but... Now we got, uh... We got three little Indians left, and, uh... That's good, because the escape shuttle only has three cryopods in it. So... I forget what happens to Ash in the um, in the original Dan O'Bannon script. I'd have to I'd have to look that up again because obviously the the android was, uh, aspect was added later by Walter Hill and David Guiler. So now they're uh, they're prepping to blow up the ship and uh, make a a getaway. Um, getting to, this is like we're getting towards the tail end of the second act um at, at this point Ripley fixes her hair while she's yeah getting ready makes sense <laughs> yeah cause who wouldn't she fix need, their hair no she needs to be quicker yeah yeah you know she doesn't have time to deal with that Right, yeah. No, for sure. It's, um... 
a little bit yeah, of character. It's, it, well, it's also it's like yeah, let's get down to business, or you know, it's it's like we're working now. And then you get uh, Yafiet and uh, and Veronica Car- uh, Cartwright preparing all the gear and whatnot. Is this the same room that Harry Dean Stanton was in when he when he was? Could be. Looks similar. Uh, same set. Could be. Could be. That's a Ridley Scottism. Oh yeah. It was like. It's like is is the planet at the beginning of Prometheus? Is that a uh, Earth or an alien planet? Yeah, could be. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. If it works, it works. Yeah, I, and I think we need to know, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that was supposed to be Earth. I thought so too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so. Um, yeah, I actually didn't make a whole lot of notes for this part of the movie. Um,. But uh, I, 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 I think that what's um, I think the this whole bit leading up to, of course, the two of them, yeah, uh, Cartwright and uh, Yafayette, yeah. Well, I mean, and so now we got uh, Ripley here is like, you know, literally gonna gotta save the cat, which is almost yeah. kind of, kind of a late game establishing her as the hero. If you think about it, mm-hmm. yeah. well, I think that helps out the movie a lot because mm-hmm. then you don't, you know, the first time you watch it, you don't know who's gonna right. die first, right? And, and and if you recall back to the beginning, she's not staged prominently at the dinner table, you know. They so you're not, yeah, you're absolutely not thinking she's gonna end up being the last survivor. Mm-hmm. But um, for those who are unaware, saving the cat is like a screenwriting term for like. We uh, you you would typically do that like at the beginning of the movie to have a character do something good to make them likable, and you know call it saving the cat. So we have Ripley mm-hmm. literally kind of saving the cat um, in, in a later part of the movie where it's becoming more and more clear about whose story this this actually is, and you know. I don't know if that's deliberate or not. It's interesting. Oh, that, is that like the third jump scare by this damn cat? Oh, it was, it's, it's fucking... yeah, that, that cat's a jump scare machine. Yeah. Yeah. Jonesy, you, you scallywag. There's a, there was a note earlier um, with... Um, Jones, you know, snarling uh, when the alien was getting Harry Dean Stanton. They actually brought like a Rottweiler in, I think. Wow. To me. Oh, okay, so. Scare the cat? Yeah. Uh-huh. No animals were harmed during the making of this film. Just a little scared. Yeah, that's all. Just a little scared. Uh, now, uh, now we're getting the. Uh, there's an interesting extended version of the scene. It's. I'm glad it was caught because it didn't look good, but it had the alien kind of coming in as like this crab walk kind of thing. It looked like a guy in a suit. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Yeah, there's there's one shot coming up where I can tell the alien's just a guy in a suit. Yeah, but here, it, it, here it looks good, well, I it, think. Yeah, no, it looks... It, it, that one, it, eh. Yeah, but it's so quick. Yeah. Right. It, it works. It really, it's the last... It's the very end of the movie. Yep. It's like, okay, yep. yeah, yeah, that, it's like, okay, this... This this doesn't look good. Yep. Um, we'll get we'll talk about that when we see it. But uh, yeah, the alien <laughs> whacks him with his penis. Oh. I I always interpreted that because it's like he's you can see which way the alien is facing, and then Rafiak uh, gets hit with its tail, and it's like is that supposed to be like its penis. It was coming up from between his legs, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which makes sense. It's a. Oh, those close-ups though, with that water yeah, that, coming off yeah, of it. Yeah, it's a it's a reproductive nightmare. <laughs> okay, that one's a little. Yeah, it works. Uh, uh, it th- works okay, so it's... this this is from Brett's scene earlier in the movie. Oh, really? Yeah. Now this is horrifying because it's like you know what's happening to Lambert. She's being killed, but it's like there's a there's a hint that it's not like she's 
like like there's something else happening it's being hinted like like she's not just getting killed like it almost sounds like she's being violated in some other way and it's like ugh. i mean especially since we just kind of hinted that the tail is kind of like the penis uh, yeah. in some way so it's like yeah Uh, and now we're in Act Three. So Ripley has to get the hell out of Dodge. So, I love these close-ups here yeah. of her turning on each one. Of, you know, well, turning, it, it, interacting with this yeah, it, mechanical it, thing. Yeah, it emphasizes the intensity. Of, of every little action like mm -hmm. knowing like we have to do each and every one of these little things in order to get out of the ship alive and yeah. that's uh you know it's it's good filmmaking yeah so, so uh, in uh, she even has to take the time to read yeah the instructions oh yeah because she just you know she just works for the company right. like like it's and you wouldn't normally be you know thinking about blowing up the ship right. so yeah it, it, they did a really great job in this movie establishing all these characters as every men and mm -hmm. you know and that just is another example but and they st they stay in character they really are character the same character through the entire movie yeah. you know yeah, she takes charge and yeah, well, it, makes sure she survives, but she doesn't change yeah. who she is from the beginning. Of yeah, the yeah, she doesn't turn in like like that was one of the things with Alien Covenant is like Catherine Rawson turns into like this badass hero with the yeah I'm gonna shoot this alien and I'm kind of like she's way too eager to fight the alien and it's like that's not what a real person would be. Sure, yeah. <laughs> It's not the yeah, Alien Covenant is not as brilliant as this movie. I think it's the, the, as fun. I think it's as fun though. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. The, again, Alien Covenant was the thing that worked about that movie was was David mm -hmm. Michael Fassbender. He he made that movie. Um. Yeah, so we get uh we get Jones here. Now I so, now I forget where, but there's actually supposed to be a point where Ripley runs into Dallas and Brett again in the director's cut. Oh, with where they're the, the cocooned. Other, yeah, they're cocooned yeah. and being transformed into eggs. Yep. And um, it's interesting. It's a little too complicated. Yeah, it's, I like this. I, it, I, yeah, it's it it it's supposed to tie up a loose end, but it it just ends up asking more questions. Mm hmm They got killed. Yeah. Leave it at that. We don't need to. So, yeah. That was a good cut. Yeah, it was. This, this is scary, but... Um, and this the strobe light going yeah. with a little... Uh, it's probably just something covering a light and uncovering it. Sure. But, but it's ugh. all. But it's also like, where, where's, where was the seizure warning? <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Um, I like this little moment coming up here with the alien and Jonesy because it shows that the creature actually has some kind of curiosity and it's not just a mindless murder machine well we'll see later that the alien can feel pain right yeah which is you know a weird thing after what you've seen this whole movie yeah you know? yeah 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 it, it is you're right um i i think there was some question marks though about um what was going to happen from this point and I think one of the things was the alien was supposed to somehow infect Jonesy and that's how it gets onto the ship later, but that's too complicated. Too much. Yeah, too much. Yeah. The simplicity is yeah. what's great about this movie, just like Halloween yeah. and Yeah. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Most good horror movies yeah. gain something from being simplified. You know, a hundred percent. It's same thing with that egg morphine thing. It's just there's actually there's like a schism in the alien fan community between people who like this movie and like James Cameron's next movie. And I, I feel kind of like the egg morphing thing is just a little bit 
it's it's too weird Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's too weird even for something alien um uh probably got a bunch of people that are that disagree with me on that please comment below you bitch that's her catchphrase (laughs) yep (laughs) it is I was just verifying. <laughs> that mother is a bitch, though, because it's like, yeah, I shut it. I just shut it down. Bitch. Yeah. Um. But yeah, she's uh, she's got to make a run for the shuttle, and I think she's only got like two minutes left before this thing, whole thing blows up. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. There's a strobing light. Yeah. God, that looks good. Yeah, this is great. And the, the flamethrower. Uh, nice touch. That point of view shot there. Yeah, because it's like you knew the alien was just here. So, yeah. Yeah, so it's like, where is it? Um, and of course course um we know where it really ran off to um but um we don't know at at the, at, the, at this point in time only in hindsight uh, yeah again the pacing in this movie very deliberate very drawn out it's really playing with the audience's imagination like where could that thing have gone and i and and i wouldn't be surprised that there are people who are thinking like did it do something to the cat right? yeah you know it does kind of set that up as something that could have happened yeah yeah but in hindsight knowing that's not the case it, it does kind of lend a little bit of an interesting character to the alien and then when you watch the thing later on yeah. You don't know what happened with oh, that dog. Right. <laughs> well, right. <laughs> it was the dog was obviously not the dog. The dog was the thing. Yeah. And it's... You had to choose between the thing and alien, which is the better sci-fi horror. Man, yeah. that's a tough choice. Yeah, yeah, it really is, right? Yeah. I, I think you'd go with alien. I, I'd. It's tough, man. Yeah. It actually is really tough for me. I I might go with Alien. The I'm, thing is good. The thing is great. No, the thing is, yeah, it is amazing. I'm just I'm inclined to go with Alien. Yeah. But, but it's it it that's a tough call. For, I think this is the Sigourney Weaver movie. Yeah. You know. Well, this and Aliens. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and Alien Three, to, to, which you haven't seen. I haven't that. seen Alien yeah. Three. I got. I'm yeah. looking forward to that. Yeah, that's a, that's an inter- That's gonna be an interesting one to talk about. Uh, so you just saw the Purge uh, yeah. thing. Yeah, R- Ridley Scott recycled that for Blade Runner. And, oh yeah. And there's a whole bunch of people that think based on that, <laughs> Alien and Blade Runner are in the same universe. Okay. But um, legally speaking, they aren't. Because Alien is 20th Century Fox and Blade Runner is Warner Brothers. Oh. So while I have no doubt in my mind as a creative, Ridley Scott thinks that they're in the same universe because, you know, that I don't think he cares. I don't. Yeah, I don't think he cares. And also, they're they're actually uh, there's too many discrepancies in the timeline between the two films for that to be the case. But that's nerdy. <laughs> that's nerdy stuff. So. This was originally the end of the movie. That's one of the shots. Yeah. There, that I'm like, eh, it looks good though. Yeah, it's like two, it's it's kind of like Poor Man's 2001. And yeah. All. Right. Yeah, and it's like, how many times does this thing blow up? Yeah, we keep, <laughs> we keep seeing these just kind of cheap flashing lights. Yeah. But it, you I know, it works. But I'm also not sure what's supposed to be represented here. Does it yeah. blow up three times, or is the explosion like catching up to Ripley? I don't know. <laughs> there's that kind of 2001 yeah. thing yeah yeah half expecting the star baby to show up at the yeah. end yeah <laughs> well the alien the aliens laying there like one 
Yeah, so this was the ending. This is Ripley was going to have the narration, final report of the Starship. Right here. Yeah. 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 Um, But Ridley... They just said, eh, we'll throw in one more. Well, Ridley convinced the studio to give him three more days of filming to shoot uh, the fourth act, as he called it. Hmm. Um, And... This is actually interesting because this is a little, if you're li- listening to the score, uh, we get kind of a return to the uh, more of the uh, wondrous part of um, Jerry Goldsmith's score before everything went to hell. Um, here, so it, it, it is a little bit calming. Um, but the question I have here is like, does, does this work as a fake ending because to me it almost feels like it's drawing it out instead of just ending you know what, what do you think about that you know the first time i was expecting it to just be this was the end you know it was going to be another minute and i was like oh shit oh, okay. you know yeah yeah, yeah. okay uh, i mean it, i i'm bringing up these questions just kind yeah. of just because it, it occurs to me I mean, the first time I watched the movie, I don't know how long ago it was, but the se- even the second time I watched it, which was like five years after I watched the first one, I probably thought, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, that this was the so, end. So, so here's a controversial moment coming up in the film, which is uh, the the strip tease here. I think well, it's like right after. This. I think it's great. Oh yeah, because she looks like a real yeah. woman. You know, she's not that. Her body's not that impressive. Well, Which well, is a good, I think it's a really good. Well, thing. well, sure, sure. I, 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 th- I think the controversy is like, is it exploitive or like, is it se- is sexist or is it, is it like the argument for it is it, it reminds the audience that Ripley is a woman and that she's a feminine character, but then there's also the possibility is like, is it just like titillating? He would no, I think he would have photographed it differently. If he wanted it to be titillating, you know, I think the way that it's, yeah, photographed to kind of de-emphasize it, it just yeah. makes her yeah a person, and it also yeah. makes her a little bit more vulnerable. Yes, um, yeah, it's like you feel like you can be vulnerable, and then you all of a sudden realize you are vulnerable. Uh, the alien just blends in with the uh, with the uh, scenery here. Hi. Uh. <laughs> yep. No, you, hey, you thought you could get away from me, didn't you? <laughs> the way she figures out her way out of this, I love the way you can see her thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. You know? There was originally a lot more that was going to happen here. Like, the okay. alien was supposed to come up to the window, and there was supposed to be, like, this Beauty and the Beast kind of moment between them. Mm. Like, the alien almost seems to be like looking at her body which is another reason for like the strip tease so i got a question for you how yeah. did the alien know to get on that little yeah, I don't thing know. i is he smart I, I think it could be smart i i mean i i mean i think it, there's something very on you they did try with the ending of this movie originally they tried to play a little bit more with questioning exactly what this thing is and they were trying to show like it does have an intelligence like like i said it was supposed to go in and like almost admire her body almost and then it was actual this is the thing that almost got ridley scott fired was they were going to it really ridley wanted the alien to kill ripley and then it was going to deliver the uh, message at the end in in her voice and they're like if you do that you're done that would be pretty cool i would have been cool it would have been a completely different ending yeah i it would have been different i don't know yeah. if that necessarily works and i think I at this know. point given all the stress that we've i'd be gone, down for it that'd be cool i i i'm of the opposite opinion i feel like given all the stress that we've just gone through um we need to see her win i i, I as an audience we need to have that catharsis of, of seeing someone attain victory over over this thing. That's, see, I would have wanted to see the sequel to that ending. <laughs> well, Ridley wanted to 
really had ideas to continue this, and yeah. uh, he was a little bit disappointed that the, nobody asked him to do uh, the sequel. Yeah. Um, he actually he was thinking Prometheus stuff all the way back then. He wanted oh, okay. he wanted to go back and explain what happened with the space jockey and everything. Okay. The studio wasn't very keen on it. Understandable. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Cameron did a great job with Aliens. Yeah, I, 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 I think Aliens is is a good sequel to this movie. I think it's a great sequel to this movie. Mm-hmm. I I'm not of the of of the opinion that one movie ruins the other. Mm-mm. I, I no. think they complement each other. Yeah, and I, I like the way Cameron builds on this whole world. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. He's just taking it. He's just vibing. He's not doing anything. He's scary. Yeah, this is really... So, so um, Ripley starts singing Lucky Star here, just kind of impromptu, and... Um, and uh, the studio was very, very unhappy with that. Cause they had to pay for it. They're like, do you know how much Lucky Star is? They had to buy it from MGM. Wow. <laughs> uh, it was in Singing in the Rain. It's like, here's that moment you were talking about the alien almost seeming to kind of feel a yeah. little bit of pain. And there's something scary about knowing that we can... You know that that it, it's somewhat yeah, right rela- yeah it's somewhat yeah. relatable and it's just screaming. Yeah, and it puts the rest of the move the what you've seen before it into a new kind of perspective. Yeah, oh yeah, this is just a creature trying to survive. Yeah, yeah, in the way that he knows how. Oh uh, yeah, and 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 so is she. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they're they're almost kind of equals in a weird way. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a, that's a shot you see in a lot of slasher movies, is the final girl looking eye to eye with but, the... But there's even then, when it's just crawling out of the vents and whatnot, it's like, she lives in space, and she lives in a spaceship, and this thing also kind of is part of that environment, mm-hmm. you know? So, yeah, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of layers to, you know, what's ultimately a very simple story. Lucky star. Hi. And yeah, here we go. And here's the here, 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 special here, effect yeah, is coming up. Yeah, here's the here's the shot that just doesn't work. Right here. <laughs> yeah, this is this doesn't work. The, the, this this everything about this shot doesn't work. This looks so fake. Uh, yeah, uh, that's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it's like the end of Psycho. Yeah, when, uh, but the last kill there. Also, the almost kill. but it's like whatever. It's the very end of the movie, right? And emotionally, you're just in the moment of seeing them finally purge this thing. Yeah, and I think there's also an argument to be made that the alien is vulnerable in this scene as well. So, kind of putting it in that kind of spotlight where we're seeing it. In a way that looks a little bit silly, maybe. Uh, that's I'm I'm stretching, obviously. Oh, that's a real Dutch angle there. I didn't notice that. Kind of is. It's also just water and lights, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's like. And yeah, I like, yeah, it's like, I like the water falling on the camera. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because it's like, oh, well, it's like plasma. Okay. Yeah. It, it works. But, but yeah, seeing the seeing the alien for what it is i guess it, you could make an argument that that's you know so yeah now we're uh, now we're at now we're at the end of the movie the sign off last survivor of the nostromo signing off and a little bit of shadow on her face and half of it slid up and yep it's a beautiful shot that's that's classic lighting. And uh well, she's now she can now she can rest and that's and so can the audience, knowing that for now the nightmare has been purged. And then we see her again in sixty years. Really? Well it's like fifty seven years after uh, Aliens? Yeah. Oh, she wow. just gets lost in space. I did not know that. Yeah, so that was uh that was Alien. Um 
I think it absolutely holds up as a mm-hmm. as a movie. Uh, it's 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 brilliant. Oh, Derek Van Lennon. Would you say it's the best of the whole series? Yes, I I think that's a pretty easy call to make. Okay. Um, I would say Aliens is close second. Okay. Um, I'd probably agree with you. Except I really like Covenant too. I don't know which see, I'd put higher that one or Covenant. Well, it's kind of like Star Wars. Like everyone can agree that the first two, like Empire and uh, the first Star Wars, are. I'd go with Star Wars. Uh, yeah, but most people can agree that um, those two are the best, and then yeah. everything else is really just a matter of opinion of what order you're gonna put it in. Yeah. Um, same thing with the same thing with Alien because there's some people that, you know understandably do not like alien three. And then there's a lot of people who are like, you know, I think it's really artistic. Um, so, and then there's people who absolutely refuse to acknowledge Prometheus and covenant. Um, and then there's people that, you know, adore those films. And I personally like all the alien movies, even the ones that are controversial. So I got to see three and the uh, resurrection. Well, they're on our oh, list. Oh, Mobius. Yep. Oh, He's yep. got a credit. Oh, there he is. Yeah, those are coming up. We're going to be doing, uh, we'll be doing Aliens next, and but then uh, we'll move into the uh, the last ones. We got three more. We're halfway there. Wow. Um, so, yeah. Here on some of the Jerry Goldsmith score, the, um, Wonder part of it. Oh, I, 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 I always forget how to pronounce his name. Yeah, yes. it's just eight foot tall Jamaican. Incidental name. music from Mozart. I didn't see that song. Yeah. You said there was a song that played. Yeah, there was like the from something. Yeah, I. Oh, maybe that was it. Yeah, maybe that's what Dallas was listening to. Okay. Yeah. Eastman. Um. All right. So yeah, I think we're uh, we're approaching the end of the credits here. So um. Uh, thanks for uh, listening to the commentary. If you enjoyed this, uh, be sure to like and subscribe to Studio Utani, and uh, we'll catch you next time.